Welcome to the Global Foundry's technical webinar, Why Designers Are Choosing 22 Nanometer FDSOI Process Technology. Hi, my name is Sean O'Kane from ChipEstimate.com. We are pleased to introduce the speakers and leaders of the FDX product team at Global Foundries. Please welcome Subi Kanjeri, Vice President, General Management, CMOS Business Unit. Nara Yanan Ramani, Director, Field Application Engineering. And Jamie Schaefer, Director, Product Management. Now let's join the product experts to learn about the reasons for FDSOI success in the design community. So we have an interesting panel discussion today. We have uh, experts um, from the field and then from product management, and I'll represent the designers from the field as well. So talking about why 22FDX is really gaining traction as the technology of choice, what we'll do here is we'll go through some of the interesting uh, topics, for dis uh, take some of the interesting topics for discussion. And um, the first thing is let's start off with a little bit of uh, technology pathfinding history. Where was 28 nanometer and then what was the next node uh, that was being considered? There were options and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll go into the 22 FDX traction itself and you know which market segments are primarily the uh, markets that are uh, gaining traction for 22 FDX and why and what are the compelling values that our customers are seeing. And more importantly, what has Global Foundries been doing to achieve system level optimization? And then we'll go into uh, some of the concerns that we had heard from the field and from the rest of the world. And we'll definitely address all of that as well. And then uh, talk about the silicon proof points and the maturity of the process. Th those are all very important topics. And then finally, we'll leave with uh, the road ahead. You know, what's the real roadmap? How far can FDX scale? I'm sure uh, these are all very interesting topics. We'll try to cover all of that uh, in the next 45 minutes. Going to the 28 nanometer onwards. Right? So if you take a look at um, Global Foundries R&D, we typically have invested about a billion, two billion point two uh, dollars per year on R&D from pathfinding to exploratory to technology development. At the time when uh, 28 nanometer was at its peak, which is actually from a volume point of view, it is still at a very high level today. But we are talking about five years back when the whole industry was looking at what should have been or what should be the next technology node. The whole industry was looking at extending the planar technology versus trying to look at the 3D. And uh, so that's how FinFET came into play, as we all know. But at the same time, Global Foundries was looking at FDSOI to extend the planar technology as well. And as you know, we are one of the uh, only foundries in the world to have both FinFET and FDSOI. So while FinFET is definitely the right technology for uh, very advanced uh, CPUs and discrete GPUs and many of those high-end servers, what we realized is FDSOI definitely is the most optimal technology for almost 80% of the market for, uh, I mean, specifically where ultra-low power is critical and, and, of course, cost. So let's talk to uh, our panelists and understand the view both from the field and also from a technology architecture point of view. So, so Narayan, the, the view is that 28 nanometer is still, you know, at, at its uh, at, at its peak in terms of the volume in the, in the industry, as you see. But when customers look at migrating from 28 nanometer to the next node, FDSOI is uh, is one of the the most um, optimal options, as we hear. What is your view from the field? Yeah, thanks, Subi. <clears throat> Very good question. One that uh, all my customers are grappling with as well. Um, I would say there are maybe three sets of customers. Um, at the high end, like you mentioned earlier, the people who've gone down the path of servers, uh, high-performance servers, uh, high-end networking, uh, even high-performance mobile AP, they've, they've chosen the path to go to FinFET and looking at you know, 14, 16, and then beyond to 10 and 7. Uh, then there's another set of customers who basically, they have a broad portfolio. They have some, some products in the high-end segments. Others are still at 28 or 40. Uh, and they're trying to figure out, you know, they've made an initial investment into FinFET. Do they continue down that path for the broader portfolio, or do they find a more cost-effective solution? And those third set of customers who have not gone down the path of FinFET yet, who are still sitting in the older nodes, 
And for them, uh, it's a real question. Do you really need the performance of FinFET? Uh, can we do something different, which is much more cost effective? So I see these three sets of customers uh, in various points of decision making. And we are seeing that you know having a, a cost effective, high performance node like FTSOI in between 28 nanometer and in between the FinFET nodes can can be highly attractive, and that's why we're seeing a lot of traction in the market. That's that's really good. But from a technology architecture point of view, Jamie, what are some of the compelling values that uh, that were actually put in to this process node? Yeah, the dual roadmap um, is really interesting. You know. Uh, Initially, there were just a handful of customers who went down the FinFET roadmap, but these are customers mm -hmm. needing the highest performance and the most digital density. And then the perception was 28 would be a very long-lived node um, that customers would remain on for a very long time. However, with the FDSOI roadmap, that now unlocks a roadmap for those customers stuck in 28 or even maybe stuck back in 40 or 55 nanometer nodes, a roadmap for lower power. Um, a roadmap for flexible integration of RF and analog with very superior characteristics compared to FinFET. <coughs> uh, ability to, uh, for flexible integration to ability to integrate embedded non-volatile memory and mm -hmm. the ability to integrate power management or PMIC into a chip. And so, to do that in a very cost-effective manner. Wow. So, so you're saying that really this can be a, r a real platform solution for many, many different applications. That's right, yes. It is uh, providing a very nice platform solution. Um, we are seeing customers adopt it across a range of applications. Um, it's finding a lot of value in the RF um, mm -hmm. millimeter wave space, uh, where its unique characteristics, in particular its highest FT F max of any advanced CMOS node, uh, is a very good match for uh, next generation 5T 5G transistors, uh, LTE transceivers, sorry, 5G um, transceivers, LTE transceivers, uh, Wi-Fi, and automotive radar applications that also operate up in the uh, 77 gigahertz range. That's excellent. But then if you dive a little deeper and look at some of the most important applications, especially the growing applications like mobility, what are some of the key values that our customers can derive from this technology? Yeah, I mean, mobility is a very cost-challenged market, and FDX provides a solution to achieve the performance you need for mobility markets, you know, performance in the 1.3 up to 2, 2.5 gigahertz range uh, in a very cost-effective manner. And you can do this by taking advantage of the low mass count. So 22 FDX, for instance, has only 36 mask layers for seven layers of metal, which is a common configuration for mobile applications. It's very cost effective. You can easily optimize performance uh, for the pr uh, frequencies you need in, on an ARM A53 of about 1.5 gigahertz. And with body bias, this unique capability in FDSI technology, you have the ability to boost that performance up to 2.1 gigahertz um, and also design compensating for process variation, uh, aging, and temperature effects with that body bias knob. That's excellent. So, Narayan, from the field point of view, what are some of the uh, interesting compel or compelling values that your customers see, especially for the mobility market? <coughs> I think uh, the mobility market, like I said before, the high end mobility is already moved to FinFET and, and, and the you know, 10, 7 nodes is what they're looking at. On the low end, uh, they're still, you know, at 28 nanometer, and and really the question is, you know, do I just uh, leverage my investment that I already made in FinFET, or is there some compelling value uh, that you know that staying in 22 or going to 22 of DX makes a lot more sense? Okay. Uh, so I think customers are really evaluating it. They're looking at the advantages that many of the advantages that Jamie mentioned, yeah, and and saying maybe this is a more cost-effective way for a long-term roadmap. Uh, you know, going to 22 right now and then longer term to 12 mm -hmm. uh, for the low and mid end. That's excellent. One of the other uh, important markets is really automotive. As we all know, there's so many, so much of semiconductor um, in the cars today. And can we talk about that a little bit? So, Jimmy, from automotive point of view, how does FDSOI really play an important role in uh, in adding significant value to automotive products? Yeah, I mean, I think. If you think 
about the explosion of silicon in the automo automobile that's happening today. Uh, it's really the electronics in the car that are providing the next the differentiation for the next generation automobile. Everywhere from the ADAS capability, uh, mm -hmm. where 22FDX provides the power and performance needed for those applications, to the millimeter wave radar. So we talked a little bit about the RF and the uh, millimeter wave capabilities and the high FTF max of 22FDX. Uh, millimeter wave that plays very well into next generation millimeter wa wave radar needs, as well as uh, you know the increased number of sensors on an automobile for uh, image processing mm -hmm. and recognition, as well as the growth of body electronics, where that flexible ability to integrate high voltage electronics, the embedded non volatile memory, are, are all key features of body electronics in automobile. And FDSOI provides that flexible capability um, for automotive. That's excellent. But but let's look at some of the actually the two key values there, right? You just mentioned the RF and the millimeter wave and the imaging. Can we dive a little deeper into what what is so interesting about FDSOI in terms of the intrinsic value that it provides for RF and millimeter wave and also imaging? Yeah, so in terms of RF and millimeter wave, I think the first thing to mention is it's the highest FT and F max. So if you benchmarked anything from the 65 nanometer node down to 16 or 10 nanometer node, you'd find the highest FT and F max and values that are very close to what you would find in a silicon germanium technology today. But you have the ability to do much more integration with the high digital density as well as the high RF performance. So when you say integration, you mean you don't have to have multiple chips. Now you can have a monolithic chip with RF, SIGI, you know, digital and analog, all of that combined. And, and I'm sure there are many advantages of having that in terms of reliability, which is also very important for automotive, and of course, the form factor and the power and the cost. Is that right? Exactly right, Subi. And, um, you know, we at, at Global Foundries are doing a lot of pathfinding work with an RF uh, design pathfinding team we have today to prove out some of these capabilities, the unique capabilities of FDSY, taking advantage of the high performance RF, uh, also taking advantage of the body bias capabilities for RF circuits. And with that, there are novel circuit topologies that are being developed, as well as the ability to integrate the front end module into the transceiver portion of the chip uh, with very uh, high performance RF capabilities, about 50 dB. So, so let's, dB let's talk about the pathfinding in, in just a second, right? But, but what is important here is, so you're saying that as a foundry, you really invested in, I mean, we invested in RF and pathfinding, we brought in an expert team, and uh, so let's talk to Narayan and see how is that valuable in the field? Yeah, I think the, the RF pathfinding has been truly differentiating for us. Uh, you know, this having a group of designers uh, doing, you know, PAs, LNAs ahead of time with our PDK, uh, there's twofold effect, right? One is they're working out the bugs in the PDK, making sure, you know, the, the you know we're going to be completely ready for customers. They're providing a lot of valuable input to our design enablement team. And second, they actually have silicon proven, you know, designs that we can take to our customers. And when they are talking to the designers at my customers, it's a designer to designer conversation. So they really... Uh, are able to work out issues, uh, understand you know some of the challenges the customer faces, and provide potential uh, solutions. So the uh, fabulous company designers and the foundry technologists can speak the same language. That, that is exactly right. Uh, so it really has helped us bridge that gap uh, with the customers, uh, and it's really uh, something the customers now nowadays ask for. Hey, can we talk to the to your team uh, to get uh, more uh, more insight in, in, into your art of design here? Uh, so that's been a truly differentiating for us, and I think we are starting to see this in other areas as well, like in the AP, where we talked about A53 design as well, where so, we've been doing a similar thing. So in that case, I have two questions. So one is, you just said all the pathfinding work that was done, building all of the you know modules in RFN, analog and millimeter wave, all those circuits are available for our customers' use? That, that is correct. So it's not only just a, a reference design for you know showing customers the capability of the technology, but it's a starting point for them if they so choose to use it. Of course, uh, they 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 have the most experience in design and product Correct. design from the previous generations. This just uh, gives them a starting point with FDX. But uh, but the point here is, since this team has understood the value of FDSOI and extracted the full benefits of FDSOI technology in the circuits. Customers don't have to spend time learning all those over and again, right? So they can leverage all the work that was that was already done by this pathfinding team. That, that is exactly right. It's, it's, it provides a great starting point. My, my second question is actually to Jamie. 
typically the RF technology is added as a module after the digital logic platform is fully qualified, you know, somewhere about a year or a year and a half later. That's, that's what has been historically the case. But in this case, it looks like the RF technology was brought up concurrently with digital logic. What, what was the rationale behind that, Jimmy? Yeah, typically RF is an afterthought. It's what you wait till a stable 1.0 mature PDK and then you start bringing in the RF characteristics. However, we recognize the u unique value of this technology for RF and okay. millimeter wave capabilities. And as a result, the process itself was co-optimized for RF performance at the same time as the digital performance during the development. That way, um, when we added the RF capabilities and the RF PDK, we didn't sacrifice anything in RF performance uh, as a result of having it based on a digital platform. It was co-optimized from the beginning. I really want to go a little bit deeper into that in just a second, but let's also just take one other important market uh, segment, the IoT. So Jamie and Narayan, both of you, can you quickly comment on what do you see uh, from a technology architecture value point of view, that's you, Jamie, and then from a field response, Narayan, if you can quickly respond. How is 22FDX for IoT gaining traction? You know, many of our IoT customers are actually migrating from 40 nanometer or 55 nanometer today. And 22FDX, they're finding, is a really good fit for them. A couple of reasons. One, there's a very natural migration from 40 nanometer into 22. You get about 60% more dye per wafer by going from 40 to 22. Wow. In addition, a lot of the IoT customers like 40 in these older nodes because they provide low standby leakage. And many of the advanced technology nodes do not provide such low standby leakage because you're scaling gate oxide thickness, you're scaling the, the gate length of the device. In 22 FDX, we've co-optimized uh, the low digital of the low dynamic power you get to also carry over that low static leakage you get in a 40 nanometer or a 55 nanometer technology today. And we've developed transistors that can get you to one picoamp per cell standby leakage. We have SRAMs today uh, capable of 0.28 volts retention voltage. So that serves very well for uh, the IoT applications where you know people talk about 10 year battery life as an example, right? That's right, yes. I mean, if you if you think about kind of the ideal IoT system architecture, right, you want to integrate a little bit of RF, we have that capability. You need to integrate some uh, digital that has low active power when it's on, and then you'll want to shut that off entirely when it's off. You need some sort of always on, very low standby leakage, and you need the ability then to integrate um, uh, flash memory, and which we have with our embedded MRAM technology, as well as power management into the IoT chip. All those components are available with 22FTX technology today. So this is excellent. So you, you're also talking about IPs here, which is Bluetooth low energy and Wi-Fi. We have not really seen any foundry offering, you know, Bluetooth LE and Wi-Fi as an IP, a drop-in IP. Is that uh, going to be silicon validated very soon and be available for our customers? That is going to be silicon validated, validated very soon uh, for our customers. So low power. Um, low power RFIP for IoT chips, as well as our RF reference design pathfinding team is developing some narrowband IoT uh, circuits themselves. Excellent. So Narayan, from the field point of view, you know, for the first time, Foundry is really offering a full Bluetooth, you know, low energy IP, completely validated and in, in, as a drop-in IP, and also a full Wi-Fi, and I know Global Foundry is also continuing to work on the LTE and the CAD M uh, NB IoT as well. How differentiate it is that kind of solution for uh, customers? Yeah, I think definitely customers are very interested in this. We have multiple customers wanting to take advantage of this and use the IP in their designs. Uh, they're also, you know, asking for our help and support in terms of uh, helping them with the with the IoT as uh, you know design itself. Uh, so we're seeing a, a significant pull from the customers in this uh, particular area. Excellent. And, and having, you know, uh, and Jamie briefly mentioned this, but uh, but having the ultra low power capability and ultra low leakage capability uh, is truly differentiating in the in the IoT space out here. Uh, as you know, in the older bulk uh, technology nodes, uh, the lowest it can go is 0.7 volts and above. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case. You know, we have out there libraries out there that can go down to 0.5 today mm -hmm. uh, as a starting point and eventually go down to 0.4 where we already have some silicon proof point. 
so having the ULP capability uh, operating at really low voltage, low power, having ultra low leakage, NVM, RF, all these things customers see as huge value. So, so then uh, the things that you guys just said actually is very interesting. I see it in uh, three levels. One is the technology itself is differentiated and optimized for uh, for many of those emerging applications. The second one is there are so many design knobs that you can use to innovate from what I just heard. And on top of that, you're providing the entire IP set and EDA flow and the full enablement. So with all that, we hope to see highly differentiated products you know, in the coming years. Is that right? That, that's something I would agree. I think you can you already see some implementations coming out from mm-hmm. our customers. Uh, you know, uh, doing a 0.4 volt library, for example. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot more differentiated products with, uh, you know, the ULP, ULL usage, uh, body bias, yes. uh, and, you know, all these other capabilities. Excellent. That's right. The market traction is phenomenal. We have over 90 customers using the PDK today. Very nice. Uh, we have over 50 customers who are deeply engaged with our Invicus IP team today on the IPs for the technology. Um, and we see traction in all our target markets on, on FDX technology. But let's also go to um, one other important point here is we have been talking about body bias across all of these market segments. So if you want to look at body bias as one of the most important differentiation, which it is, but I think it's it's also important to dive a little deeper into that. What are some of the key applications of, uh, of body bias in all of those market segments? Yeah, I think you know body bias is great for uh, higher performance cores, say an A53 or an A72 for low and mid-tier mobile applications, right? Where you need high performance, but you always also need the low cost and the densest area. So let's just take one example. So let's say you were to design a core at 1.5 gigahertz, mm-hmm. typically, right? You would have to design that to the slow, slow corner in order to comp- in order to design plus minus 3 sigma minus you lose a lot of sigma. margin design margin on the table yeah a lot of, yep exactly a lot of margining for process variation for reliability aging effects yeah. and uh, temperature however in 22 FTX uh, you have the capability to implement the design in just the typical typical corner mm-hmm. and then you can use body bias mm-hmm. after the fact mm-hmm. to compensate for any process variation and for aging uh, in in your in reliability aging in that process so and you're saying that customer you no know, designers can actually design the chip for typical condition yes and well, then bring it back to the typical condition wherever the process is post silicon and by or, doing that, that or they can do it uh, you know a little bit more conservatively by doing one sigma instead of three yes. sigma right? okay i mean that's up to designers but the point here is theoretically you can go all the way to just designing to typical but if designers want to be a little bit more conservative like naran you said maybe they can design to plus minus one sigma instead of plus minus three sigma that in itself is a significant advantage that's right. great that's right and by doing that you you realize so significant performance uh, power and area benefits yes. because designing to that TT yes. corner. And then when you need that performance boost, right, mm-hmm. uh, you can then apply forward body bias in a boost-like mode mm-hmm. and boost it up to 30% uh, performance boost with only minor increases in the sta- in the le- in the leakage increase Excellent. as a result. And with feedback mechanisms, monitoring temperature rise, you can comp- you can uh, reduce that frequency as the temperature rise. But the key point here is you don't have to do this across all of the modules on the SOC, right? You only do it where needed. For example, if uh, let's take it, you know, as the CPU core, if it is uh, three or four percent of the total SOC area, right, and you selectively bias only that module, and the rest of the chip you design as you would normally design in a bulk uh, CMOS, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, you'd only implement on this on the uh, parts of the chip that need to have the highest frequency. That's that's really excellent. That that's really good. Okay, so that's for the digital, everything that we just talked about. But if you were to look at the back bias and the uh, the rest of the advantages of um, uh, back bias, especially on the analog and the RF, what you said earlier is that the team actually started working on RF and analog from the very beginning. Can you say a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, so... I mean, there's some very fundamental benefits of FDSOI for RF and analog. You have um, a very high self-gain compared to bulk technology. You have very low 1 over F noise characteristics. 
very high FT and F max uh, in the technology. And there's been a lot of additional optimization um, for special devices and back-end stacks uh, with ultra-thick metal put into the technology for RF. To take advantage of that and to demonstrate that true value to our customers, we have a large RF pathfinding team who is implementing those designs onto silicon. Um, and demonstrating the capabilities of the technology, but at the same time, they're providing feedback into the technology development. So through design, they're guiding the development, uh, so the design and the technology development is done, being done co concurrently. So I see the slide here that says it's a, trans a transceiver on MPW2201, which is the very first MPW. So are you saying that this team actually designed a complex uh, transceiver with the very early PDK and uh, have silicon validated the circuit on the very first MPW? That's right. This team started with just the dot three PDK. They, uh, for instance, implemented an 802.11 AC one by one MIMO design. Wow. And the silicon results meshed very well to the uh, modeled uh, results and was to their expectations with a very early PDK for an RF design. Is that what you were saying earlier about having the silicon uh, data and then feeding it back to the technology architecture to fine tune and to get uh, the right optimal parameters for the RF analog? That's right. I mean, as they designed uh, their RF circuits, they fed back where they could use it an additional device. A good example of that is the team, the RF pathfinding team came back and said, we could really use an ELVT, an extra uh, extreme low VT device in the technology. And we were able to then develop that device, particularly to help optimize some of these RF circuits that they were developing. That's excellent. So unlike in uh, many other technologies where, like you said earlier, RF is an afterthought and we'll have to go back. And sometimes it can actually impact the lo digital logic process as well, but in this case, since it was concurrently optimized, both digital logic and RF mature at about the same time. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Oh, fantastic. So let's talk about uh, the back bias on the RF and the analog. So there are uh, significant values of having back bias you know, for the digital logic like you both already mentioned, but I think uh, one other thing uh, as a part of the pathfinding and the, the team actually worked on trying to extract the full benefit of FDX, FDSOI, uh, especially the 22FDX, with back bias. So if you just have to list out without going into all of those details, um, one of them is, of course, you can increase the IDSAT or ION or IF, IOF ratio. You can change the resistance you know, with back bias dynamically or real time if you want to, and there are some very interesting applications of that. You can shift the DC operating point, obviously. You can change the GM and... Uh, GM for that matter, you can fine tune and uh, trim the mismatch. Uh, of course, the mismatch inherently is already much better from uh, if you look at the AVT for bulk CMOS, which is about 2.4. In in this case, it's about half of that, which is 1.2. But on top of that, if you want to make further corrections post silicon, you can do that as well. So there are some significant values of having the back gate. Uh, you know, for the RF and the analog applications. So, so Narayan, are, are uh, your customers taking advantage of this in their uh, latest designs? Yeah, I think the, the way uh, this is going to play out, uh, I think customers are looking at first uh, the inherent value of FDSOI as is uh, for their very first designs. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as they gain more confidence uh, in, in the technology, they're starting to explore back bias now. Mm -hmm. And I expect fully that, you know, the follow-on products will will fully utilize back bias and yeah. these kind of uh, back uh, techniques. Very good. Okay, I think we talked about all of the benefits and um, the advantages and the compelling value of 22FDX. I, I want to switch gears here a little bit. From the field point of view, what are some of the concerns that, um, that your customers are seeing today? We don't have to list all of that in the interest of time, but let's hit the most important ones. I think, you know, uh, with any new technology, there's always uh, some questions customers have. Uh, in this case, uh, customers have been used to designing with bulk and then FinFET now, uh, more recently. Uh, SOI has been, you know, a few select customers have experienced in SOI, not everybody. So self-heating is, is a key question that they have in mind. What is the effect on SOI? But, but if you take a step back and look at the categories at a very high level, is it fair to say, there are uh, there were some technical concerns. Then there were maybe a few commercial uh, questions or concerns, and then maybe supply assurance. Right. So on the technical side, you know things like self-heating, variability, uh, you know across the substrate, across the wafer, 
uh, those those are some of the concerns. There's also concerns about had had been concerns about uh, you know supply assurance. I think we've come a long way uh, from the early days of FDSOI to the point I think you know and, and maybe Jamie can highlight this where we are today. Uh, I think most customers uh, feel assured that uh, we've crossed those bridges. Very good. So so let's go one by one very quickly on that. Okay. So let's take one of the technical con- technical concerns that customers talk about or ha- were talking about the self-heating effect. I think there is a mis- misunderstanding about the seriousness of the self-heating effect uh, in our customer base. Jamie, how is this being addressed? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to understand about self-heating effect is the difference just between PDSOI, partially depleted SOI, where self-heating has been a larger concern in exactly. FDSOI, mm-hmm. uh, fully depleted SOI. So in partially depleted SOI, you're actually dealing with much thicker uh, SOI and yeah. much, much thicker buried oxide layers. They're about an f- order of magnitude thicker than they are in part fully depleted SOI. In fully depleted SOI, they're only 8 nanometers thick SOI and only 20 nanometers thick uh, buried oxide. And as a result, the, temper- the, the heat conduction across that 20 nanometer thick SOI layer is much reduced compared to, uh, or much improved, I should say, compared to a uh, partially depleted SOI technology. And and also unlike the PDSOI, you know, FDSOI does not have any of the history effects and all those challenges either, right? So it's as close as possible to bulk CMOS, pretty much. That's right. Unlike a partially depleted SOI technology, you, you don't have uh, um, um, history effects uh, because it's fully depleted. Any carrier created in the body of the device is immediately swept to the drain side. Um, so that's not a concern in fully depleted SOI. So without ha- without the history effect and with very little self heating effect, it's as good as a bulk CMOS technology. And I assume all of the design enablement to support and design around the self heating effect is already you know enabled. Yeah, you know I think the the key here is we have experience as a foundry with partially depleted SOI technologies. We've been manufacturing PDSOI technologies for over 15 years in Fab One Dresden. Yeah. Um, we do know to how to handle self-heating effects from a design side, and we do model self-heating on our FDSOI technology. Excellent. We do recommend uh, mm-hmm. that for certain designs, uh, designers do model uh, with the self-heating feature turned on in the model, but we have found that for the vast majority of designs um, where the duty cycle is high or the activity factor is low, uh, there's really no need to have self Self-heating is really not a concern in the, in the design, and in that case, you can we recommend actually you turn it off to save a simulation runtime. Well, one other concern that uh, typically customers had mentioned uh, previously, I'm sure it's taken care of now, is the variability of the of the silicon thickness itself. Well, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, you know, I think in FDSOI technology, it is fully depleted. So the bi- one of the biggest advantages you get is you essentially eliminate the largest component of variation in your de- device. So you eliminate the random dopant fluctuation because you don't have dopants in the particular in in the channel. Now. Uh, as you do in FinFET, you do pick up some additional sources of variation. So FinFET, you're going to have variations in fin height and fin width, which contribute another source of variation. In FDSOI, what you pick up is you pick up fluctuations in that SOI thickness. Um, now those are closely monitored in conjunction, uh, in collaboration with our substrate suppliers. In particular, we've worked very closely with Soytec on optimizing the substrates to ensure the variation of that thickness is uh, to the specifications that uh, meet the requirements, the desired electrical uh, requirements. As, as a designer, I'm very concerned about the local mismatch versus the global mismatch. Global mismatch is something I can manage, but local mismatch is far more serious. But uh, can you tell me this variation is really impacting the local mismatch or the global mismatch or both? Yeah, so for sm- small devices, the mismatch is dominated by random dope and fluctuation, and in that case, the a- AVT or the mismatch on an FDSOI technology is vastly superior to a bulk technology. It's about 1.4 millivolt microns in 22 FDX, for instance. Now, where the substrate thickness variations do come into play are for larger devices on the order of 1 micron or 10 micron, and those are the devices on the length scale of kind of the, the variation of the substrate thickness. But for those, there's easy design techniques that analog designers know today, such as common centroid design techniques that can be used to uh, further improve mismatch on the So, so in that devices. case, what you're saying is for very small devices um, or even for SRAMs, the substrate variation is really not going to have any impact. 
That's right. Yes. Oh, sir. that's right. very good. Okay, so let's uh, switch over to some of the commercial uh, concerns that customers may have had in the past. For example, um, I remember at, at very early stages, customers were concerned about the substrate cost. How's uh, what is the response to customers? So, Narayan, uh, is that first of all still a concern in the field? Number one, number two is maybe Jimmy, you can answer that. How is that being addressed? I think you know th that's always a question that comes up. But when they look at the total number of masks that you know is there for an FDSOI process, right? Uh, like Jamie was mentioning before, uh, seven metal is 36 layers. Uh, so th the overall cost uh, cost per die is uh, substantially reduced because of that. Uh, even taking into account uh, substrate cost for FDSOI. So I think once they see the, the commercial uh, terms, I think they feel much more co confident that this is. Uh, giving you almost FinFET like performance at a 28 nanometer like uh, cost per die. Die cost, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, Jamie, from a substrate cost point of view, from the mass process simplicity and everything that Narayan just mentioned, is that does that successfully address customers' concerns? I think so. I think uh, you know the 22 nanometer design point was chosen to provide enough shrink to offset the additional substrate cost, so you could continue to provide to the customers 28 nanometer die costs, but with FinFET-like power and performance efficiency. In addition, I think customers tend to be very surprised at how low that substrate cost really is. Uh, yeah. uh, I think there's a misconception there. Uh, but with the volumes of this technology that we're going to be running and the cost optimization that we've been doing with our uh, I guess our partners in, in, in the substrate world, um, the cost of that substrate has come down substantially. That's excellent. So the, the third point was about the supply assurance, right? And uh, we know Global Founders has recently signed up with, uh, you know, uh, to build a fab in Chengdu as well. So the combined uh, wafer capacity is going to be over 1.5 million uh, wafers per year purely on uh, FDX. So that should really address any of the supply assurance concerns in the field. What do you think about it, Narayan? Yeah, I think d definitely. I think you know, two parts to it, right? The, one is the substrate supplier itself, which I think Jamie addressed, and we've been working very closely with uh, with Soytech and uh, and other suppliers uh, on, the, on the pure wafer supply itself. You know, adding this capacity in Dresden, having an additional uh, you know fab come up in China to support uh, customers there locally, uh, as hugely uh, you know. Uh, offset uh, any previous misconception that might, that might be on supply assurance. Excellent. Okay, so let's switch gears again to go into the, uh, the status of the process and the maturity of the process today. So I want to hear from Jamie where we are in terms of our uh, process maturity. Yeah, so today the uh, base platform is fully production qualified. Uh, so we are running uh, customer uh, prototype uh, designs in the factory today and they are yielding at full yield entitlement. So our logic yield, our SRAM yield, our customer product yields are all yielding at the expected defect density and it's rapidly merging with our 28 nanometer uh, production defect density. So as you know, 22FTX has about 72% of the steps in common with our 28, 28 nanometer production proven technology today and the yield ramp on 22FTX is benefiting from that. That's excellent. And then some of these IPs that were uh, the, both the foundation and the complex IPs that were developed concurrently, just like the RF pathfinding and uh, the analog and the RF IP as well. So these have gone through silicon validation and had, through multiple uh, cycles of silicon validation, and they're all available for uh, customers' use, which is also an indication of the process maturity. How is that being seen in the field, Narayan? I, th I think, you know, the portfolio of IP that we have today on FTSOI is is really comprehensive, uh, so across multiple segments. So I think clearly customers see that, and I think what we did was very early on we started uh, uh, even with the very early PDKs, the foundation IP and some complex IP uh, uh, characterization has been done, which has given us a lot of uh, confidence in the maturity of the process. Uh, so I think the IP story has been uh, has been well received for the most part. So when when you come to product process qual, can you briefly explain how rigorous is the process qual process uh, process itself or a process qual methodology? Yeah. So the process qual itself is. Um I guess a inclusive call, call, call that is basically meant to si simulate uh, uh, customer products. So we have 
logic test vehicles with over 10 million gates. We have uh, multiple memories uh, designed at up to 128 megabit memories. We're doing concurrent IP development on the technology, so we have three cycles of IP development that's being done concurrently with the, um, with the technology bring up, so that IP can then also be optimized for the process technology. Uh, that IP is validated for body bias uh, conditions in, as we as we develop the technology. Excellent. So, so what you're showing here is just one of the many many test chips that were used to qualify the process. That's right. Excellent. So analog designs, process monitors, memories, fuses, they're all brought up and qualified with the technology. Excellent. Now, if you look at the um, the complex IPs, I do see some of the results um, that were shown earlier as well. These are excellent results. So these were um, silicon validated, which means the design should have started almost about you know 12 to 18 months earlier on a on a very immature PDK. Even with that, we see such excellent results, and um, so that is an indication of the maturity of the process itself. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, this has been something that you know we've been highlight highlighting to our customers, and they and they see it. A uh, combination of having silicon validated IP uh, as well as uh, the other things we talked about earlier, which is basically demonstrating reference circuits like, you know, performance on A53 or an RF pathfinding design with IP. All these things basically offer a complete solution to customers, and I think they see the value there. Excellent. So in terms of the availability of all of these IPs, I think uh, customers can talk to Invicus directly. Absolutely. Is that how it is? Absolutely. Okay. I think you know we work. Invicus is a is a very key partner. Uh, there are other P, other IP partners as well. We're working with in the ecosystem, uh, FD Accelerator, uh, but uh, certainly these uh, partners are supporting customers in the field uh, directly as well. Good, but uh, but there are also some very early adapters who took, um, you know, a leap, and and jumped into taking full advantage of this 22 FDX. And uh, at a very early stage, they took it all the way to a system level solution. And this is one of the examples. Can you talk a little bit more about this, both Jamie and Narayan, please? Start with Jamie. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we're looking to basically uh, use early designs as kind of a forcing function uh, to drive the technology development. Uh, we've partnered here with uh, a company called DreamChip. Um, who had developed an ADAS or a driver's information system out of 22 FDX. It's a very complex chip, and but it is functional. It's been demonstrated. Um, there's video that's operational with the particular chip on 22 FDX today as an early proof point of the technology. So I understand ARM, Cadence, Arteries, Invicus, of course, Global Foundries, many partners came together to make this happen, but in, on a very short uh, you know, on a very short cycle, plus using one of the very early PDKs and IP, all that coming together and being fully functional all the way to the system software, that's uh, that's really, um, you know, excellent. What is the feedback from the field on this, Narayan? I think customers always like seeing a demonstration on silicon of the technology capabilities, and this is a great example of that. Uh, I think they, they, they gives them confidence that look, you know, when they when they design today, uh, they expect to see basically results, which which what which is what the simulations tell them. Excellent. Uh, so I think this has been, been a very good uh, confidence boost for the market. You know, yeah. After proving the capabilities of the technology, are there really kind of three main obstacles I think we have to had to overcome to get FTSOI to gain traction in the market? One was, do you have a um, do you have a second source? You know, we have the second Fab in Fab 11 Chengdu coming online. Do you have an ecosystem? And this here, this example from Dreamchip, is it a great example of the multiple companies who are seeing the value in FTSOI and want to be part of the growing, rapidly growing FTSOI ecosystem? We have an ecosystem program called the FD Accelerator. And the third piece, um, you know, which maybe we'll transition to the next part of the talk, is uh, do you have a roadmap? Yeah, and we do have a roadmap now to 12 FTX. That's and, uh, one, more, one more point to add out here is, you know, I think uh, it shows that the ecosystem is coming together to really participate in FTSOI. Very good. And, and we're seeing that uh, across the EDA tool chain, uh, and customers are seeing that when they talk to the EDA vendors as well. Excellent. So going back to Jamie's point in terms of the, uh, the roadmap and the scalability of FDX, so I understand 12 FDX is under development now. 
So can you talk about a few interesting uh, key or rather key points of uh, 12 FDX? That is right. It is under development. We do have first test chips actually already running in the factory today on 12 FDX. Uh, so 12 FDX is basically a full node shrink of mm -hmm. 22 FDX. Um, it will be about 0.53x or almost 50% smaller area than 22 FDX. Um, it has 10 FinFET level power and performance. We have validated that in our early PDK that has been released on, on, on 12 FDX. Global Foundry has enough experience on 10 nanometer FinFET as a part of our pathfinding and exploration. That's right, yes. There's certainly uh, was substantial work done on the 10 nanometer node at Global Foundries. Very good. So what about in terms of the cost and um, let's talk about the, the performance. I mean, you do mention here that with BackBuzz you can uh, approach 10 nanometer FinFET-like performance. That's excellent. But what about the, the masks and uh, the die cost? Well, we consider the, the cost of fish, you know, there's an explosion of mass counts as you go to advanced nodes. And we consider um, one of the key differentiating capabilities to be the low mass counts on 22 and then 12 FTX. We've architected 12 FTX to also uh, be very cost efficient with about 40% fewer mass than a 10 nanometer FinFET process today. You know, if you think about that, that brings other benefits. It brings m much faster cycle time, faster time to markets, uh, and lower overall mass costs. So same performance as 10 nanometer, but half the total number of masks as 10 nanometer. That's, that's, that's correct. a significant yeah. innovation there. Okay, what about the scalability and uh, you know of, of 12 FDX overall, and plus what are the key values for especially? Let's talk about mobility, which is a very high volume market. Yeah, so I think if you look at both 22 and 12, right, these could easily satisfy low and mid tier mobility markets. They have the performance to do that, but they're much more cost efficient than uh, a FinFET technology today, which is being adopted for the premium in the high tier markets. So, so sorry to interrupt, but, but you're saying that all the values that we already talked about for 22 FDX is going to be carried over to 12 FDX and more. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, and what is the feedback from the field, Narayan? I think I'll the field is very important to in, uh, in the field is very important to have a a roadmap continuity of roadmap. You don't want uh, 22 FDX to be a single node investment, right? So they're spending a lot of uh, time and effort to design to 22 FDX, and they want to know that they can take those designs to the next generation. So having 12 FDX on the roadmap is is very critical, and and having a performance and say you know the same advantages we see in 22 FDX, right? Uh, significant uh, cost uh, benefits. Uh, at a very low mass count, uh, performance like FinFET, we're seeing that carry over to 12. Right? Where this definition, if it's 10 nanometer like performance at a much lower cost point, uh, is is a significant value to customers. So, so in the interest of time, if you want to pick maybe two key values and differentiating values rather compared to 22 FDX, what are those on 12 FDX? For example, are you talking about you know dual sided back bias? dual direction or bi-directional back bias compared to 22 FDX? Is that possible on 12? Yeah, so I think um, there are some enhanced features of body bias coming in on 12 FDX. Excellent. Uh, one of which is you actually have the ability to do um, what we call bi-directional body biasing. Uh, so you have the ability to both forward body bias, which means lowering, dynamically lowering the threshold voltage of the transistor, but on the same transistors you actually have the ability to reverse body bias and raise those to to minimize standby leakage on those on those particular devices in 12 FDX. Excellent. And then maybe in terms of the power and performance, you, I know you already mentioned that. So if you can really get a 10 nanometer like power and performance at a you know, much cheaper, let's say about 30 to 40 percent lower die cost compared to 10 nanometer, this is going to be a significant node and a long node. Do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. I think I think one of the key things is how extendable this is, right? So you could start, and by leveraging body bias, right, 22 can then kind of be extended to uh, beyond fin 14 nanometer FinFET-like performance, 12 yeah. FinFET-like performance. If you start with 12 and you start leveraging body bias, you can extend it past 10 to almost 7 FinFET-like performance. And it's extendable then to, uh, you know, millimeter wave, RF, uh, Wi-Fi and IoT applications to extend the life of that platform within within your corporation. Exactly. So, so Narayan, do you agree that you know combination of 12, 22 and then 12 
will will be able to cover almost 80 percent of the uh, applications and market segments for the next I don't know maybe you know eight to ten years I think so I think you know I think if you look at the the different segments we talked about uh, clearly there's a, a significant value for the low end and mid end AP for automotive we talked about all the different things uh, that this technology brings uh, including for example uh, offering uh, you know grade one uh, plus, uh, you know, automotive for IP, automotive. And, uh, you know, and combination with NVM for N MCUs. Uh, I, I see this, you know, is going to be a long play, both in 22 and 12. And you, you'll always have, you know, the premium, premium high chasing performance nodes uh, or segments. But for the rest of the segments, I think this is going to be uh, a very cost effective, uh, very valuable technology. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Why Designers Are Choosing 22 Nanometer FDSOI Process Technology. If you have any questions, please email them to marketing at globalfoundries.com or contact your local Global Foundries office. Also, more information about FDSOI, FinFET, ASIC, RF, and other technologies can be found at globalfoundries.com.